1 Timothy chapter 6, read verses 17 through 19. 1 Timothy chapter 6, 17 through 19. I'm glad you're here today. I'm glad you braved the cold and the roads to be here today. And I know for some of you it was braving. I mean, especially those that maybe came from certain areas of the valley. <laughs> um, there was a lot of snow. And so I thank you for being here. And for, but not for me or for anyone else, but here to hear God's word and to worship him. I want to remind you of a couple of things before we get into this. I don't usually like to do this, but just it's a lot of stuff going on. Um, continue to pray for Pastor Higgins, Mrs. Higgins. Continue to pray for Herschel Winkomplex. Herschel is not doing well. Um, he is, uh, he can't be around people. Um, they've got so many medicines on him right now in him that his immune system is, is, is shot. And um, so Carol let me know that they won't be around people and for a while because if this doesn't work, they're going to have to admit him to the hospital. Um, so be in prayer for him. Wally is doing well, um, still um, doing treatment, chemotherapy in about a week, another round of chemotherapy for his lymphoma, um, but he is in good spirits, but pray for that. And then also, our brother Surin is not doing well either. And so be in prayer for these dear saints as we, as we think about this week. Before we get into the text at hand, let me comment once again, as I have several times in our study, of the sovereignty of God as seen in the commitment to expositional preaching. Um, I did not choose this text for today, and that's always a freeing thing when you're a pastor. No, you did not choose the text. That God did. Um, and so, God chose this text today, and he did a year ago when he um, decided we were going to preach through 1 Timothy. And he decided it would fall upon this Sunday, we would be looking at this passage of Scripture. I did not plan this. There were some things that came in that I didn't know it would be this day. But this is the day that God has for it, and it's extremely applicable um, to us in America today, but also very applicable to our church in a very real way right now. And so, let's read these three verses and then look in God's Word. 1 Timothy 6, 17, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they, not, they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good, and that they be rich in good works, ready to, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. If your family or household income is more than $10,000 per year, you are richer than 84% of the world. If your family or household income is more than $50,000 per year, you are richer than 99% of the world. I know that not everyone here has that kind of income, but I would just make a comment as we look at this text concerning, as it says, them that are rich in this world, I'd make this comment that given all the political upheavals in the last couple of years with, these, with people protesting this and that and the other thing, that in a very real sense, if you want to use the modern colloquial language, Americans are all one percenters. As a whole, we are a very blessed nation. We have much in this world, in worldly goods. It has become fashionable, though, within our current societal and political climate to hear statistics like this and thus then villainize the wealthiest people. <laughs> um, it is also very popular to suggest that people are only wealthy because they have profited off the backs of the rest of the poor. And they are, therefore, the only way to make this right is to take from the rich and give to the poor. Uh, this not only makes terrible sense logically, it is not biblical either, which is more important than logically. The scripture is full in both Old Testament and New Testament with examples of godly, wealthy people. As well as instructions for how we are to handle wealth. Wealth, money, material possessions are not intrinsically evil. In fact, this text before us right here, if they were, if it was that you would expect Paul to say or, or to bring some kind of condemnation down on those that are rich. But he doesn't do that. Instead, what he does in this text is he goes to the heart of the person who does indeed have some level of abundance, some level of riches. 
and addresses the heart issue, not the concept that the poor are necessarily godly and the rich are necessarily godless or the other way around, every way you want to look at it. God doesn't make those kinds of arbitrary external designations. In Christ, there is neither male nor female, bond nor free, Jew nor Gentile, and although it doesn't say this, it says this, impl implies this other places in the scripture, there's neither poor nor rich. <laughs> In fact, when we looked at this, when we looked at slavery a while back in Timothy, that was one of the concepts, was the man who is free, remember he's the slave of the Lord, and the man who is a slave, remember he's God's free man. You see, because God doesn't look on man's outward appearance, he looks at the heart. But also, the same God who looks at the heart does say, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so it is possible then to understand where my heart is by looking at my external motives and, and, and what I do with even my finances. So I don't provide those statistics to support the foolhardy notion that by punishing the wealthy somehow social justice is achieved. Nor to say that Americans are too wealthy and make moral judgments that it's not mine to make regarding that. But to point out, however you may feel you are doing financially these days when many people are struggling compared to the rest of the world, we are indeed blessed and abundant. We are indeed blessed and abundant. And thus, I think you know where I'm going with this, the text does apply to us. Whether we feel rich or not, the text does apply to us. I simply wanted to share these statistics before beginning to explain that the text, to explain because that none are tempted to say, well then, this text doesn't apply to me, I'm not rich. But more than just statistics shows us that indeed this does apply to you and me, our own experience does as well, doesn't it? All of us, if we desire, will eat lunch after the sermon today. And probably will not be like the dirt cookies of Haiti, which have no nourishment value, but simply fill up the children to stop the hunger pains while they starve to death. Most of us probably aren't going to have that before us as our lunch today. Most of us, rather than thinking about whether we're going to eat lunch today, are deciding where we're going to eat lunch, or what kind, or what sides are going to go along with our main dish. Most of us are probably in that kind of a situation today. And our lunch will probably fill us up, and it'll probably be a warm place out of the bitter cold out there. And after that, some of you, uh, and, and if you won't, maybe you, you can if you want, will take a nap on a soft couch, or at least a carpeted floor. And although there are many difficulties in this economy, most of us here have jobs to go to on Monday. And if not, you have the opportunity to place in applications and to look for jobs on Monday. But also, when you wake up, when I wake up Monday morning before you go to your job, you will probably take a hot shower. And you'll probably be able to do that every morning this week. You will probably go out to your car and warm it up. Some maybe even have heated seats, which is even great. <laughs> Don't have to start it to warm it up, just turn those seats on. Many of us will go out and we'll choose which car we are going to take. On top of that, when you're hungry in the middle of the night tonight, you'll be able to go to your cupboard or refrigerator and get what you want to eat. And if you don't have anything you want to eat, don't worry, Taco Bell is open late. You can probably go get something to kill you there. Most of us will probably also, most of us, sometime this month, will have a $5 cup of coffee. It'll be all seasoned up with stuff, right? Because the eggnog and the pumpkin stuff they do around this time of year. But you may say, well, I don't do that. Well, you probably could, <laughs> even if you choose not to spend it on that. Some of us may even have a $5 cup of coffee every week. You see, I hope I'm, my goal is not to make anyone feel guilty about, uh, about, about having blessings. That's not the point. To feel guilty about God's blessings is to thus challenge the goodness of God. It is not a proper response to feel guilty about being blessed by God. That would, be, that would be a mistaken idea. In fact, this text proves that because it says God gives us all things richly to enjoy. 
He gives us that. And the goal is not to make us feel guilty about what we have, but rather to look and to get a proper understanding of where we sit in the stream of human history when it comes to the abundance of God. Just where we sit in this country in which we live. Where we sit in this society. Look around you. We have a heater to keep this building warm. One of the reasons why we have out in our foyer a picture of believers gathered in the snow, having a communion service. In, it's actually a picture from the Ukraine in the former Soviet Union, from that area. It's to remind us, not, of, not, not to just glory in the blessings, temporal blessings we have, but to remind us there is something far more valuable, far more important than earthly blessings. But at the same time to recognize that we, God is the author of these earthly blessings. And He has blessed you. Some of you have struggled in your job. Some of you are struggling with your bills. Some of you are struggling in finances. But even with all of that, you are warm, you are clothed, and you are filled today. God is good. And He gives us all these things richly to enjoy. Glorify and praise God for His goodness. Don't feel guilty over His goodness, but glorify God for His goodness. But also take this text of Scripture, we ought to take this text of Scripture before us and apply it then to us, should we not? Charge them that are rich. Now, not only does our experience reveal for us that indeed we are rich, but, and not only does um, the statistics show us that we are indeed rich, but even the word that God uses here, shows that this text does apply to us. The word rich there, plusios, plusios um, is translated in many different ways, wealth, riches, but one of the chief lexicon definitions of this word is simply the word abundant. Abundant. Or another word that it sometimes is understood as is blessed. And so the word itself is a broad enough lexical definition that it, we don't, well, it's not referring to the 150,000 a year people or the 300,000, the millionaires. That's not what the word means in the Greek. The word means those that have abundance, those that are blessed, those that have. And so I do know it after looking at that word that that definitely does apply to me, and I think it applies to you too. We do have, we are blessed. And so Paul's charge to Timothy is that he communicates some important principles to those who find themselves by the grace of God and the blessing of God in a state of abundance. And so we have to take very close heed to this. Now here's what's also fascinating to me. Have you noticed that in this last chapter, 21 verses, two separate occasions in this last writing, Paul brings up this issue of finances. Did you notice that? He did previously when he speaks of the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, right? He also, he talks about those that desire to be rich, those that desire to and make that their goal, will fall into snare and condemnation. But not only this chapter, but also in this short book, six chapters, written a personal letter to Timothy, where are you going to write to the guy? He, he, he's struggling. Doctrinal issues are at stake here, but you notice also he talks about the issue of finances and elders, Right? Was another issue. You notice that's not all, though. Did he not also talk about finances and our family? Widows and widows indeed, and the needs of that, and the church's finances regarding that. In fact, if you look at it, compared to the amount of words in Timothy, it speaks more of finances than most other books of the New Testament. And this is one of Paul's last letters he's writing. If you take a broader picture, you will find out that the Scripture speaks much of finances. I believe the Scripture talks much about wealth and riches and abundance for two main reasons. One, God loves to bless people. And two, people usually don't handle that blessing well. God blesses us and we don't handle it well. But then again, would that not be the example of going beyond riches of the whole Old Testament, all the blessings God gave to Israel in bringing them out of the land and the manna He fed them with and the pheasant and the water and, the, and, and all those things. But the Bible says that they complained and grumbled and fought. That's the human experience. God blesses. We respond wrongly. The scripture is not silent when it comes to finances. Sadly, many churches are, 
One of the reasons many churches or pastors are is because of all the many that aren't. <laughs> you know, the ones on TV and what, that, uh, and the religions that make it seem and makes you believe that indeed all the church ever wants is just more of my money. <laughs> and because of that, there sometimes is this tendency to avoid the topic by those that don't want to be categorized and put in there. I find myself in that same situation often. I don't like talking about this, but the problem is Paul said that he had a clear conscience into the Ephesians because he had not shunned to declare unto them the whole counsel of God. And so even those maybe pastors with a good heart that refuse to speak of finances are failing because they are not declaring unto God's people the whole counsel of God. So we want to do it right. We want to do it according to the Bible. And that's why I love expositional preaching because God chose the text this morning. <laughs> he, it's just going through the letter of 1 Timothy. And this is where we're at. And I believe if you preach expositionally through the New Testament, through the Bible, everything that needs to be said will be said. And so you don't have to worry about this issue and that issue and running to this topic and that topic. You just preach through it, it'll all be said. And so I thank God for that. As we move forward in this text, though, we understand that Paul is giving a warning. How do we know he's giving a warning? Because the very first word, he says, charge them. He's talking to Timothy. Charge them. Who are the them there? Well, them that are rich in this world. Those that have abundance in this age. Charge them. Command them. The word charge there is often used by the apostle when he's giving a very serious thing. Uh, a very uh, dangerous situation rises up. Here's a warning. This is a warning. Watch out. That's, the, that's what he wants Timothy to say. Watch out. Watch out for something. There's a, it's a very dangerous thing. Be warned. Those who are blessed with God's gracious abundance in the now age, be warned. And so this is for the American church. This is for Grace Baptist Church. Those who are blessed with God's gracious abundance in the now age, be warned. You think of our church and the abundance God has given us, individually and corporately. Think of the abundance God has given us. Six warnings or commands are used in the following the charge. <laughs> Six of them. As objects to say what, is, what, what, what it is that he is warning them about. What Timothy is to charge them concerning. And what I must charge you about today. And these warnings are directly tied to our abundant financial blessings. The structure is fascinating and helpful. The first two are negatives. The first two warnings are negatives. And they follow with the first command affecting the second. In other words, he'll give two warnings. The first one is a very general one, and the second one follows that one. And then the, 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 the first two are about the attitudes we must have when it comes to financial blessing. And the last four commands of the six are grouped together in pairs of two and are positive expressions of what we must then do. So the first two are don't do this. The last four are do this in groups of two. So the first are, don't think this way, attitudes. The last are, do these things, actions. And so the attitudes begets the actions. How we view our financial blessing has a profound effect on what we do with our financial blessing. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's not saying, that Scripture of Jesus, and we're going to refer to this passage a few times today, that passage, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, quoted by Jesus, that is not saying, put your treasure somewhere so your heart will go there. It's not what that's saying. That, that's backwards. He's saying, where your treasure is, your heart's already there. <laughs> Your heart will be there. The idea then is look and see where your treasure is and you'll have a good idea where your heart is. You figure it out. So attitudes produce actions. Thinking produces consequences. Beliefs produce behaviors. Understand that, right? Beliefs produce behaviors. We do what we do because we believe something about it. And so that's why he begins with the attitude before he goes to the actions. And that's where we're going to begin as well this morning. As the Proverbs say in Proverbs 23, 7, As a man so thinketh in his heart, so is he. Or literally, so he does. <laughs> what a man thinks he does. So let's begin in the text of Scripture here with these commands, these warnings to us that are abundant. The right attitude toward wealth 
toward abundance is very important. He says here the first command is, charge them that are rich in this world, this now age, literally, this present life, that are rich now, not necessarily that have a lot of stuff, but in this age would be considered wealthy, charge them that, this is the first command, do, do this or don't do this, be not high-minded. Proud, arrogant is the word high-minded. Do not be arrogant. Now, high-minded is an excellent translation because it pictures the Greek word combination well because it's really two words. It's the idea of lofty thinking. Lofty thinking. To think highly of oneself. But why this warning is being tied to abundance is more interesting. Should not everyone watch out for pride? Even the poor? Well, definitely. But there is a danger, a specific unique danger that comes when we live comfortable lives in this age. Expressed by Proverbs 30, 8 through 9 very well. Proverbs says this, Proverbs 30, 8 through 9 says, Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. This is why, the Proverbs says why, lest I be full. You see the word abundant there? Lest I have abundance, and what's the response? He says there, and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? The particular warning against the full person, the particular danger that accompanies them, is they look around at all that they have and they say, who needs God? Who needs Him? I mean, I got everything I need. What do I need anymore? I'm good. Now, Proverbs will go on to say the particular danger of the poor person is they will steal and then blaspheme his name. Because they don't have. So the prayer is, don't give me either poverty or riches. Because I don't want to be tempted when I'm poor to steal. And I don't want to be tempted when I'm rich to forget God. But that Proverbs illustrates to us the common issue that often arises when we are full. And has that not happened in the culture in which we live in the United States of America? Have we not become comfortable and full? And have we not then seen that this current generation that has had everything that they need, the millennial generation, they're up and coming on under 30 year olds and on down. Do you know that recent statistics, less than 7% of this generation considers themselves religious at all? Any religion, good, good or bad ones. In fact, they, they, they suppose that there's between 2 to 5% of this, and this is the largest generation in the history of America. Less than 2 to 5%, around that, that percentage is what they estimate, um, that would call themselves born again or evangelical. That's a huge amount of people. Where did that come from? Well, when you are comfortable, when you are full, when you have everything you need, it's very common to turn and say, who is the Lord? What has God done for me lately? I've done this myself. Or my parents have done this, or my grandparents have done this, or, or I, I deserve, I deserve, I deserve, and I get, and I have. That's the particular danger. Now, no one generation only owns this. This is a common thing. It's written back here in Proverbs. I don't want to disparage any one generation. This is a problem for any man, but it's, history has proved when people begin to be comfortable in their abundance, they very quickly have the tendency to forget that God is the one who is God and not them. So the warning is very apt, and we see why it comes right away when he be, speaks of those that are wealthy. Be warned. When you are comfortable, when you have abundance, be warned. The thought, the attitude that will naturally follow in the flesh is a high-minded attitude, a proud attitude. And I can do it myself. I can do it my way. I have what I need. I do what I want. I'm the master of my fate. I'm the one who chooses my domain. I do it. I, I, I. But the scripture is very clear that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Be not high-minded. Now the second charge follows that one. That they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches in the text there. You see, when we are high-minded, we stop trusting in God. We say, who is the Lord? And we are people that must trust. The word there, trust, is the same word, hope. In the Bible, it's the idea of confidence. Confidence. 
When we stop trusting God, we begin to think more of ourselves, it becomes very natural that we have an empty spot in our souls because God created us to worship Him and Him alone. And so we need something to worship. We need something to hope and We need something that will give us confidence. And so people turn to relationships. People turn to alcohol. People turn to drugs. People turn to immorality. People turn to all kinds of things. But one chief way people turn in a comfortable situation is they often turn to their riches, their wealth, as something to trust in. It has been said, and I think probably accurately so in our country, our coins say, in God we trust. Intentionally put on the coins, but we've come a far ways from in God we trust to in the coins we trust. But the warning here is when you get proud, be watch out because what will follow next is beginning to trust in uncertain riches. Begin to trust in uncertain riches. Where is your confidence? Is your confidence in your job? Is your confidence in your retirement account? Is your confidence in your insurance? If you're confident, is your confidence in your plenty, your, your home, your car, yourself, your work ethic, your ability to work hard? Is that where your confidence lies? Why should we not be confident in uncertain riches? Why not? Well, I think he tells us two reasons here. The first one is just that adjective that comes before the word riches. Because this is what characterizes wealth. Uncertainty. You get the idea. He says, and it makes sense, right? It's a logical progression. Why would you be confident in an uncertainty? Why would you hope in an uncertainty? You see, we ought to not hope in riches, but hope in the living God, because financial success is uncertain, but the living God's promises are. Financial success is uncertain, but the living God's promises are. The little word is convicting, uncertain. Why would you hope in an uncertainty when the sovereign and living God, author of all life and giver of all things, is the same yesterday, today, and forever? <laughs> That's certain. He is certain, and He is certain to perform His word, and He has said, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then all these things shall be added to you. Why do we get it backwards? Because hoping in riches is easy. It is sight. It is trusting in the living God is hard. It is faith. Just admit it along with me. I am anxious over my financial situation because of a lack of faith. I can say it's because of the job market. I can say it's because I've been burdened in the past. I can say all these reasons. But as a believer in Jesus Christ, one who is seeking to hope in God, I can honestly tell you that the reason why I become anxious over my financial situation is not because of the government we have or all these issues, but because I am weak in faith. I am not trusting in the living God. And that's why he puts these together here. Nor trust in uncertain riches, notice in the text, but trust in the living God. As you see in the text what Paul does here. He makes it one or the other, right? Either trust in uncertain riches or in the living God. And the, it's a tremendous thing. Uncertainty or certainty. <coughs> He's appealing to the logic. You see, we must have that material good because we are of little faith. Not because we really have to have it. We don't give and tithe to the work of the Lord because our faith is weak. Not because we can't afford it. I know this is convicting, but it is God's word. Riches are uncertain. God is not. Who will you hope in? Who will you put your confidence in? How are riches uncertain? Well, just think for a moment, right? <laughs> think of your last year. How are riches uncertain? Well, think back further. Remember, it was just prior to 2008 when a famous lawmaker said that the real estate always increases in value. That didn't happen. Remember your first job. What happened to your first paycheck? Can you even remember what you spent it on? Remember that time you got sick and your vacation money that you had saved up needed to be spent? We could go on and on, but I don't think we need to. Our experience verifies what the Scripture says. Riches are indeed uncertain. God is not. God is not. Hope in the living God, the sovereign God. Don't trust in riches because financial success is uncertain, but the living God's promises are. But also, don't trust in uncertain riches because you can't buy happiness, but God gives enjoyment. Look at the text of Scripture. Trust in the living God who giveth us 
richly all things to enjoy. Notice the explanation as to why we ought to trust in the living God rather than uncertain riches. Because our God, who is rich beyond measure, He owns it all, and His nature is to give. He owns it all, and His nature is to give. He owned life, so He gave it to our first parents. He owned a garden and put them in it to enjoy, and by enjoying it, to enjoy His presence. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and He gives us some of the beef to enjoy ourselves. God is rich, and He richly, notice the play on words, He richly then supplies us, gives us all things to enjoy. Now, some take this verse out of context and say that there is nothing that the Christian should not enjoy. Even sin. He gives us all things to enjoy, right? So we can enjoy sin. Obviously, the person who takes that interpretation is desperately trying to find some way to continue in their sin without feelings of guilt. This is not teaching that in the context. He's not talking about that issue. He's not talking about God gives us everything to enjoy outside of the framework and structure of His holy will and character. The point emphasis is not all. The point emphasis there is that to richly enjoy, to have pleasure in. You see, God gives us joy in the sexual relationship to enjoy within the framework of marriage. He gives us the joys of food, plant and animal to take pleasure in within the framework of moderation, wisdom, and without being intoxicated with those things. He gives us friends to enjoy, books to enjoy within the structure of what is pure, honest, good, lovely, just, true, virtuous, and of good report. So the point is not libertine, do whatever you want, it's all good, but rather the point is that God is so good to us with the riches He possesses that He desires our pleasure and joy. And he knows that we will derive the most pleasure giving him great glory by worshiping and obeying and serving him in his word. And so he gives us the ability to enjoy the things to the glory of God. And so whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, you do all to the glory of God. How do I enjoy the things God has given me and glorify God at the same time. You see, because we've bought into this, this, this tension that is, should not be there, this concept that is often thought of, that, well, that the monks had you know, either bread and water or abundance and do whatever you want. They couldn't understand that God gave us all things richly to enjoy so long as we are enjoying them as the creator of all things rather than worshiping the creation. How do you enjoy your lunch today? How do you glorify God in eating lunch? There's many ways. One, you can thank Him for it. Recognizing He is the giver of it. One, you, not, uh, two, you can share it. Because God is the giver. Give. But three, you can enjoy it. And that glorifies God. Within that framework. That glorifies God. He's given us these things to enjoy. The world loves to say that Christians, believers in the Bible, they're the you can'ts of society. You know, the miserable. Live the miserable existence. Do nothing. I'm just thankful as a believer in Christ that I have the real reason for joy in all the things that God has given in this world. And that is I recognize that He has given it. And I look at how gracious He has been and my enjoyment of this life draws me closer to the grace and glory of God. The poor unbeliever doesn't have that framework, and so all they get is the temporal joy out of it that fleets. I get the eternal joy out of it, knowing that I am glorifying God by it. It's a better way to live. <laughs> the point is that God is so good to us. He promises us so much. He gave us His Word to enjoy Him. He gave us His church to enjoy Him. He gave us His Son to enjoy eternal life and, and an incorruptible inheritance. Here's the main point. If God so viewed the riches of His grace and glory as something to be shared with His created beings who are beneath Him in power, majesty, and glory, how then can we, His created beings, do less with the temporal riches we have been given? That's the point of this right there. You notice it says there, don't trust in uncertain riches, don't be high-minded, but trust in the living God whose nature is to give to those below him. Then why do we hoard and hold back from giving to those who are equal with us? In fact, God gave the ultimate gift and that he sent his son to die for sinners on their behalf, on my behalf, on your behalf. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. Emmanuel, God with us. That's the grace of God. How then can we, 
who have so much do so little. This is the great segue transition from our attitudes about our abundance to our, action, to our actions with the abundance. That's the way the text reads. It begins with attitudes. Do not be high-minded. Don't trust in uncertain riches because riches are uncertain. God is not. And because God has given us of his riches to enjoy. And you see the next, the actions then are, then give. The right actions with the wealth follows. There are two pairs of instructions here. The first in each pair are giving the basic concept and the second building upon it. Having the right attitude about money is very important, as we already said. Don't become high-minded and don't trust in the uncertain abundance, but hope in God and with the abundance God has given you to do these two things. Uh, acting in a good way with our wealth, that's the actions, there's two commands to follow, is empty without the right attitude. And having a right attitude with not the correct actions is useless. You get the kind of idea there? If I act without the attitude, there's no benefit. But if I um, have the right attitude but don't act, what good was it? And that's the point here. Now that Paul has expressed the right heart attitude, he proceeds to explain the right actions with the financial blessings of God. And the first thing that I said, they're pairs. Notice in the text there, verse 18, how they connect together in pairs. That is the next one, to do good... To be rich in good works. You see the connection there? Do good. It's general. And then specifically when it comes to wealth, be rich in good works. He adds that. And then the second one, uh, it's hard to see in the English, a little easier in the Greek, but ready to distribute. That's ready to give or be generous. And then the next one, willing to communicate. That's literally fellowshipping or partnering with what you have. And so we have the two pairs of the commands here. Two pairs of instruction. The first one is do good with what God has given you. In this very first practical charge, we see two parts. First, do good. And then, obviously, this is for the Christians to guide their thinking and actions, not a means to earn God's favor, grace or salvation, or to keep it. But since God is good, Christ is good, and we are rightly related to God in Christ through faith in, by divine grace, ought not Christians do good as God is good? It's the concept here, do good. Should not Christians care for the hurting and thus show Christ? Should not Christians help the wounded and thus show Christ? Should not Christians treat their neighbors with kindness and respect and thus show the love of Christ? Should not Christians do good in all of life and show the kindness and goodness of God? That's a do good. But further, he continues using a play on words, if you are rich, be rich in good works. Or another way to put, put that, use your riches to do good works. Take what you have and don't just do good in a moral sense. He's not talking about a moral aspect here. He's talking about act action, activity, to do good things. And then he says, and then use what you have to do good things. If we have received such richness of grace in Christ, should we not minister that same richness of grace in others? Christians often, often fall into ditch in the two areas. They think that only preaching the gospel is doing good or they think that only feeding the hungry is good. But why can it not be both? <laughs> With obviously the preaching of the gospel because what does it profit a man if he loses against the whole world but loses his own soul as taking precedence? Well, why can't we do both? Why do we have to pit these two things against one another as you can only do one or the other? I fear that conservative Christians have fallen in the area of neglecting the fact that we've got to do good with what we have. And I believe that many in the evangelical world have neglected the gospel in this whole thing. Which is the chief part. Why can we not love our neighbors physically and temporally and also love them eternally? Why can't we do both? Not with one dependent upon the other. I don't believe they're dependent on one another. Uh, that's the idea that you have to do good to a neighbor so you can tell them the gospel. I don't believe that's true. <laughs> we can tell them the gospel no matter what and we can do good no matter what. They're not dependent on one another as if one is a, a preface to the other but rather just the simple concept of doing good to those, to others. If God has blessed you with a reliable car, can you not use that reliable car to give rides to others, to church or to the store or to an appointment? If God has blessed you with health, can you not help those who are weak physically? If God has blessed you with food, can you not share that food with another? If God has given you good, can you be rich in good works toward others? That's the point of this text. Do good. It's very simple. But the second one there is a little more convoluted in the 
with the English translation there, ready to distribute. One word, both of these are one word, <laughs> even though they're two phrases. Ready to distribute and willing to communicate, both one word each. Ready to distribute is the word to be generous, to be liberal, to be generous. Now he's talking about finances, so talking about being generous financially. A lot of people, very kindly and graciously, and I appreciate this of people, say, well, I don't give money, I give my time. It's true, good, but the text is talking about finances. <laughs> so that's what we're applying here. To be generous. That's the idea of translated ready to distribute. Be generous. A recent statistic I read showed that in American Christianity, the more a person makes, the less percentage-wise he gives to his church. <laughs> Is that not backwards? Just as in the previous point, to do good, to be rich in good works, where the second statement builds upon the first, the same construction here. To be generous... And then literally one word, as I said, and then the same word translated, the second word translated all throughout the epistles as the word fellowshipping, sharing. In fact, this second word here is the word koinonia. It's the word fellowship. And it's talking about financial things. And just as the second phrase in the verse, to be good and then to be rich in good works, rich in good works is describing how to be good, right? The same thing here. Fellowshipping or partnering or sharing, is describing how to be generous. So be generous by fellowshipping. Now, Paul the Apostle is using the same verbiage as he does in other passages that speak of our financial blessings, financial giving. In fact, the word that is used in Acts, in Corinthians, in Philippians, here in Timothy, the word that is used throughout the entire New Testament referring to those who are giving to the work of the Lord, giving to the church, is the word here. And there's a couple words, but one of the words is the word fellowshipping. The reason for that is because the, the New Testament had the concept, the biblical writers had the concept, the Spirit has the concept, that when we give to the local church as God generously as God intends... We are indeed sharing in the work of the ministry and the advance of the gospel. We are indeed fellowshipping in the advance of the gospel. You see, the problem that people have with the word fellowship today is it has been defined in our modern seeker-sensitive church culture as going somewhere to get something. I get fellowship by going somewhere. I get fellowship. In fact, I would, so I would be hard-pressed to find a church, this church, indeed, in this list, that there are not some members who have not come to me and said, I just don't get enough fellowship. And the problem with that phrase is it's a gross misuse of the word fellowship. Because fellowship is never something in the scripture that we get. The emphasis of fellowship is always the concept of giving. It's the word to share to give, to partner with. And so by simply saying, I don't get enough fellowship, the, the, the sad thing is that application of that word is more of a negative on the person who says it than the church. <laughs> because they're not giving the fellowship. That's what it means. Fellowship means to share, to give, to partner with. And so, this idea in this word, and it is used over and over again in the Scripture to refer to financial giving, and particularly referring to financial giving to the local church, to the ministry that God has called, the, the work of the Lord, to fellowship in the work of the Lord through giving. Now, that's something that, that missionaries often recognize. We have several missionaries that we help support, Not, none, none as much as I wish we could. But when they write us letters, they always close the letters with, thank you for partnering with us in our ministry. So how are we partnering with them? That's the word fellowship. Thank you for fellowship. How are we fellowshipping with them? We're not there. We're not in, in, in um, Shell, Shelly, Idaho. We're not in the Congo. We're, we're not in Beaver, Utah, where we have some missionaries. We're, we're not there. How are we fellowshipping with them? We are fellowshipping with them. They're using the biblical use of this word. We are fellowshipping with them through the finances we are giving them. We are partnering with them in this. 
in the work of the gospel. And so that is the use of this word right here. And so when I look at it in the context here, when he's talking about those that are, have abundance, those that are blessed, and he gives the attitude not to be high-minded, not to trust in uncertain riches, and then he gives the actions, do good, do good works, and then he comes to the end and he says, and be generous, and then he pinpoints and uses the word koinonia, I can think of no other thing he's talking about than he's saying that you be generous in your giving to the work of the Lord. That you be generous in your giving to the work of the Lord. That you are partnering in this. That you're a part of it. That you're fellowshipping with it. You see, there's little room for avoiding this application in this text. That we, as Timothy, tell the people there and us today, that we communicate our fellowship by generously giving to the work of the Lord. This does not mean they cannot be given to other works. But Jesus says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And here's a candid application. As we've been reviewing the grace of God and the growth of His church, here at Grace Baptist Church, there is much to be excited about. Paul told the Corinthians, who he rebuked for their using this same word, fellowship, for their lack of fellowship with their giving. He told them in 2 Corinthians 8, 7, referring to their giving. Look it up and read it yourself. Um, look at the context of it. You'll see this is very clear. Their support of the gospel ministry and the advance of God's kingdom in comparing their unwillingness to be generous and their relative wealth, Corinth was a rel relatively wealthy place, and the Philippians' generosity and their relative poverty, who's comparing them. He says this, Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith, in word, or that's evangelism, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love to us, and he says this, See that you abound in this grace also. And he's talking about giving generously to the work of the Lord. And this is the fascinating part about it. He's describing generously contributing to the work of the Lord as an aspect of grace. That goes back to this passage, right? God has richly given us grace. And we ought to contribute and share the work of the Lord. There are different ways experts categorize average giving for evangelical church in America. I was looking at some of these stats and was burdened because I, I didn't know this until I looked at the stats, but the average giver in American churches gives 3 to 4% of their income to the church. This means that the average professing Christian lives on 96% of God's abundance. That's pretty good. Lives on, that's a good abundance. But before the law was given to Moses, Abraham gave 10% of the spoils God had given him. Before the law. And the law was given and God required 10% plus be given to support his spiritual work and his people. In fact, in Malachi, God says that the people were robbing God because they were not faithful in their tithes. That's 10% in offerings. How is it then in the new covenant where God has richly blessed us with everything and so much spiritual blessings and a better covenant than when God gave Moses, we have gone backwards in the average? Could it be, and I'm asking this question as an honest question to people of God. I know that people get offended when preachers talk about money. I'm just letting the chips fall where they may. Could it be, in the abundance God has blessed in this American culture, we are robbing God? Could it be we are determining where our priorities lie? Could it be we are revealing our heart? Beloved, I desire that we abound in this grace as well. And it is hard to say, but it must be expressed. We as a church in general, and I'm speaking candidly as your pastor, we in a church in general are not abounding in this grace. In fact, it burdens me that when I figure the... And I don't know what people give, and I don't want to know. Please don't tell me. I don't want to know. But when we look at just the same statistics everyone has, every member has access to, our financial statements, when I look at those, I discovered that we actually give between 2 to 3% of the average income. And that burned into my heart because I thought, we're not even making the average of the evangelical church. And I would say that every one of us who love God would say, we want to abound in faith. We want to abound in diligence. We want to abound in love. We want to abound in evangelism. Why then are we not abounding in this grace also? What's wrong?
The re re reality of this in a candid way is that because of this, we are heading for some serious financial decisions approaching 2014. And the common question I have as a very conservative person, or common answer I usually have as a very conservative person financially, is we'll just spend less. <laughs> but that's, that's, that's solving the problem of the budget. I'm not concerned about solving the problem of the budget. I'm concerned with my heart and your heart. I'm concerned with the spiritual nature of it. Not the, God will take care of money. Money's no big deal to God. That's the easiest thing for God. <laughs> but where's our heart? I'm so concerned that I'll be misunderstood by this, but I'm not anxious about God's provision for my family, for this church, or for the budget. I'm, not, I'm concerned because we should not be satisfied to even be less than the average in obedience. I'm not saying we would look at that average as our mark. That's not the point. We should not be content to abound in many graces, but not this one. In teaching the whole counsel of God, in many ways there is a spiritual healthiness about our church that, that gives me great delight and gives you great delight and gives many people who have served in this church great delight over the years. But in this area, I'm just going to say it very frankly and bluntly to the members of Grace Baptist Church, in this area, we as a whole are not healthy. And my concern is where is our heart? Now, I do not wish that anyone would feel a twinge of guilt and then toss a little extra into the offering plate, but I speak to our members, not visitors, but to our members who have covenanted together with us to support this ministry. I speak to us, all of us, especially me. Where is my heart? And the only way I'll know is to look at where my treasure is and then make an honest evaluation from there. Now, because of the abuse and twisting of many, the concept of giving tithes and offerings has fallen out of favor today. I know that. But the concept of the tithe or the offering was an act of faith in the Old Testament, and it is still one today. And can I trust God enough? Can I trust God enough to take that tithe and that offering out of my income and then budget my life to live on the rest of what God has given me? Or... Is my tithe what is left over at the end of the week or the end of the month? Where's my heart? Preaching about money is dangerous activities. <laughs> so my goal is not to preach about money today, but rather to preach about the priorities of our heart. What happens when we do give generously to the work of the Lord, though? What happens when we give proportionately, out of faith? What happens when we give out of faith to the work of the Lord? When we use this word, fellowship, and take it seriously when it comes to the financial blessings God has given us. What happens? What is going on here? Here are some biblical concepts to consider by way of application, and then we're going to move on in the text. When I give generously to the work of the Lord, and this is, some of these are from this text and some from other texts, when I give generously to the work of the Lord, it demonstrates where my confidence rests. Does, when I can't give generously to the work of the Lord, it shows where my confidence rests as well. It shows what I'm trusting in. Is it uncertain riches or is it in the living God? Am I trusting my ability to work, the talents or the gifts, or am I trusting in the living God? But also, I am using this word here, I am partnering in God's plan, the church, what he has ordained for this dispensation. Now, a lot of people, and I'm for giving to charity and giving as God has blessed us to those in need, but I want you to understand something. God's plan for the gospel advance, whether we like it or not, in other words, whether we are happy with the certain church or not, God's plan for the advance of his kingdom is the building of his church, his local assembly. So when I fellowship, I am partnering with God's plan. Men will come with all kinds of plans, but I'm partnering with God's plan. Number three, I show myself where my heart is. And I need that. And you need that. Because, as Jeremiah says, the heart is hard to understand. <laughs> Who can understand it? <laughs> and I need that. It shows me where my heart is. In fact, I think we ought to regularly be looking at our giving, not just to the local church. We ought to be look at our giving of our lives and looking at our budgets and looking at how much money is going to the government and how much money is going to our Starbucks and how much money is going here and, and just look and see where our heart is. We just ought to do that regularly. Look and see what's going on. Because we can find ourselves doing things and we don't even realize we're doing it. Good or bad. We find ourselves doing it without the heart. But fourth... I teach the world who think this tithing thing is crazy. 
I teach the world that God is always first. I live on the rest. His kingdom is more important than mine. That's what I teach the world when I'm proportionate and generous in my giving to the work of the Lord. I remember the first time that we, we were looking for getting a loan for a house to buy a house and the, uh, the uh, loan officer could not understand why we kept taking certain percentage out of our, uh, it was about 10% of the time, a certain percentage out of our income and not counting that as the money that we had for payments. He kept saying, you have more money, you can get a bigger house because you have these, this, where, where, why are you taking this money? <laughs> he didn't understand, he thought it was crazy. <laughs> we tried to explain it to him, but he didn't get it. <laughs> they, don't, they don't understand that, but I can show them a testimony of God's grace by showing the world that God has the priority in my life. Number five, I am a part, when I, when I give generous to the work of the Lord, I am a part of God's holy means to provide for his gospel servants and kingdom advancing work. I, I learned great things from the life of George Mueller. Um, one of those individuals, you read about him, and then you go away and you just feel guilty, and you know you shouldn't feel guilty. But the man was a man of faith. A man of sacrifice. One of the things that, George, in reading the autobiography of George Mueller that I learned, is, is I, and I, my wife and I made a, made a commitment a covenant before God we would do this after reading, after I read this. Um, George Mueller said he would never talk to another man about his financial situation until he's talked to his father. <laughs> there were times then when George Mueller, because, just because people forgot, didn't get the salary to pay for food for the week. He didn't go to the church deacons, and asked them for his pay. It wasn't, it wasn't that he couldn't have. He just determined, no, I'm going to go to my father for it. It was really a rebuke to me. But I've learned, and God has been gracious to me in this, I don't ask you to give to the work of the Lord because I want you to provide for my salary. God will take care of that. He did long before I ever had a salary. He will long after I have a salary. And then when he's done taking care of it, I get to go to heaven. What's the loss there? To live as Christ, to die as gain. Woo -hoo. You win both. But you have the opportunity. We read it in 1 Timothy chapter 4, right? Or, um, sorry, chapter 5. You have the opportunity. I have the opportunity. It's for me too. It's all Christians have the opportunity to be a part of God's means for providing for those who preach his gospel. Six, I prove to my heart that I believe God's word when it says God will bless me. When I give sacrificially, it proves to my own heart that seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. It proves to my heart that when you give, God will give with it pressed together, shaken down, full measure. It proves to my heart that I know that my God will open the windows of heaven and pour out blessing. Not as a means to get that blessing I give. That is the wrong attitude. That is the prosperity gospel. That is wrong. But to trust that God is a God of blessing. When I give sacrificially, I'm proving to my own heart, I believe you, God. I believe you're a God of blessing. I don't have to worry. And then lastly, seven, I show my flesh, which is a huge enemy of mine. I think it's probably of yours as well. I show my flesh that I trust God's promises more than my circumstances. I trust my, God's promises more than my circumstances. When we do good with what God has given us, and when we are generous givers of what God has given us, we can take encouragement, as he says in the rest of this text, that we are not laying up for ourselves treasures on this earth, but instead we are laying up for ourselves a good foundation, he says in this text of Scripture. You have a good foundation in this. Now, some do misunderstand this to be saying that we have a bigger bigger house in heaven or have erroneously said we are sending up building materials to heaven. That's, that's crazy. And thus encouraging a carnal view of eternity. That's not the idea here. But even though there are error with those statements, the principle is that how we use the abundance God has given us here has an effect on our eternal joy both now and then. How we use God's abundance here has an eternal, joy on our, has an eternal effect on our joy. That's the, it says, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation. And this phrase, against the time to come. That's not talking about against the time of like the trap tribulation. Or, it's talking about against the end of the age. Against the time in heaven. The eternal state. Why though? That they may lay hold on eternal life. Maybe I should have added this as one of my points. That's why we got to give. But the reality here... <laughs> 
is he is using this phrase that he only uses here and then only uses again back in verse 12. Lay hold on eternal life. It means the same thing. It's not saying store up treasure now so you can gain eternal life. Same phrase. We looked at this before. I don't have time to go through it again. Lay hold on eternal life is talking about our focus now. The possession we already have to lay hold on it, to focus on it. And this is the overall principle that he's teaching in this text about how we are to view and handle riches. Here's how we're to view and handle riches, both our attitude and our actions. We are to do it in such a way that we are not losing our eternal focus. That we are able to lay hold on eternal life. If there is anything that can still a Christian's laying hold of eternal life, it is abundance and comfortableness. <clears throat> and that is why I am convinced that God in His grace, often when we have, it's not for long. I'm, I am confident that's God's grace. Because He knows that the more I have, if He doesn't help me get rid of that, <laughs> I'm going to stop laying hold on eternal life and start laying hold on this life. Lay hold on eternal life. Lay hold on eternal life. I know we're out of time. I went long today. I'm... Let me close with this. A Christian who holds on tightly to their abundance will hold loosely to the promises of God and will hardly live an eternally significant life will hardly live an eternally significant life. But a Christian who holds loosely to this wealth, these things will be equipped to hold tightly to eternal life and thus will live an eternally significant life. The choice is really between the temporal and the eternal in our heart. What has more value to us? Paul's closing words of the church at Ephesus through Timothy <laughs> are words that we need to hear and heed as well. If we take a look at where our treasure is, beloved, we will soon find out where our heart is. May our holy God, the one who matters, and knows the end from the beginning, not me, not my spouse, may He be pleased with where our heart is. Let's pray.